Good morning and welcome to the latest webinar from thebusinessdesk.com. I'm Ben Ormsby and I'm delighted to be bringing you uh, this session on, well, looking at the business of sport and the impacts that COVID-19 has had both as a positive and a negative on the industry. I'm joined by a fantastic panel of people uh, from across the region or Yorkshire region and beyond who will be looking at, you know, every avenue that this pandemic has hit within the business of sport. I think it's right to start by saying the last 12 months for Yorkshire's sport has been tremendous, whether it was Yorkshire cricket having record um, profits, thanks to Ashes cricket, World Cup cricket, and, uh, and a one-day international, or the triumphant return of Leeds United to where it belongs in the top flight of uh, football. So I'm going to start by asking each of the panellists to introduce themselves and just give a quick explanation of how they see the pandemic having impacted um, yeah, the business of sport. But before I do that, just a heads up, I'm sure everyone has attended plenty of Zoom events now, but if you would like to ask any questions, please use the button at the bottom of your screen and we will bring those to our um, panelists throughout the conversation. So I'll start with you, Victor, um, as sort of the man of the moment with Leeds United. How do you see uh, you know, COVID having impacted the business of, of football? Okay, I'm Victor Horta. I am the director of football of Leeds United. To be honest, for me, it's clear the true, real, and strong impact uh, the COVID in 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 my scenario. The first of all, economic, economical. The incoming uh, for the clubs is going to suffer a shock, and perhaps a, a strong punch of reality that. We are maintaining a business that realistically always all the people talk about the TV rights and, and about a lot of things, but we need the fans. We need the fans and it's the core of, of this sport. And this is for me the second situation that for me is really, really tough, that is emotional. Imagine like a Leeds United director after 16 years and don't play a Premier League. It's they that I am going to watch the game with Ellen Rome empty in a Premier League. I, I feel really sick in my heart because one of the things important in the sport, obviously, is the business. But we need to know that the sport, it's a lot of feeling for a lot of people. If we review in the history of a sport, all the times that one Olympic Games or one World Cup is cancelled, is for bad news. It's not is the thing, it's not real going to cancel. Why? Because the sport is a produce of nice feelings for the people. The sport is a produce of emphatic with the day by day. And for me, one of the things that I am feeling the last two months is a lot of people when I cross in the streets told me, when we come back to an row, when we come back to an row, because it's not the same. It's absolutely not the same. And then this was a really big impact in the two sides. Obviously, the economical side that all the people know, we analyze more or less uh, 20, 25% incoming less in the same year in Premier League, perhaps two years ago. But for me, I want to highlight the emotional situation that is true that we need to realize that if one of the reasons that I feel happy to work in a football club is about the people and now it is a tough moment that we cannot have this interaction like the people between the watch life his his team and and enjoy each weekend and i know it's only the tv that obviously is a good substitution at least but all the people in this webinar know is absolutely not the same and I, for me i am really really sad about this situation and i hope the day by day and and trying short and obviously the most important is the healthy. I am absolutely right the decisions that the governments take because it's the only way to stop the pandemic. But it's true that the real impact for me is is economical but more emotional because I feel the the I need in a moment that we can that is really important in the moment that we can. I want the people back to the sports in life because if not, it's not absolutely the same. 
John, um, obviously, I'll throw it to you to do your introduction. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Good morning, everyone. Uh, John Dutton, Chief Executive of the Rugby League World Cup 2021. Um, it's well documented the challenges that Rugby League um, has faced and the clubs in particular. Um, we're in a slightly different position. We're staging a major global tournament in 12 months' time. So the challenge for us is to manage uncertainty. Uh, we very much hope that exactly one year today, on the 5th of November, we'll be gathering at Headingley to watch New Zealand uh, play um, their game uh, against Ireland. Um, but the, the uncertainty of what's ahead um, for us, we are incredibly positive, we're incredibly optimistic uh, about the future, but the challenge of managing uncertainty is, um, is pretty hard. Dr Ingrid? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that it's certainly brought to the fore is how incredibly embedded sport is in everybody's lives, whether that's sort of just from a passing recreational aspect, whether you have a business built upon the back of sport that is there as an ancillary service, or whether you are a part of that, um, so the mainstream sports. I think it's certainly highlighted the vulnerability, if you like, of sport um, and how it impacts on everybody's life, but also the power of sport in terms of what it can do to people's lives in terms of enhancement, enjoyment, um, social well-being, um, and that most of the time it's at the heart of the community. So I think certainly um, I know sport is not necessarily, or certain sports are not necessarily as strange as a sort of um, crisis management, but certainly on this scale, I think it has really brought um, from sort of micro communities to, you know, the macro environment on a global perspective of how important sport is in everybody's lives. Richard? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you see my name there. It's Richard Kramer from Front Row Legal. I'm a solicitor based in Leeds. Hopefully many of you will know me or have heard of me. Um, I suppose I'm a little bit more distant from it because, you know, our job is very much at the computer working away, whether I'm at the office or on the road or wherever, I'm, wherever I may be. Um, so I just kind of look at the more of the kind of paperwork doing stuff day to day um, so it's not necessarily had the massive impact uh, on on us and a lot of the sort of work that we do has been adjusted to dealing with stuff online uh, but um, just listening to what um, Victor John and Ingrid have had to say um, I think we took everything for granted in our lives whether we go on holiday whether we go to a restaurant whether we go to a sports event it's almost like we just had that freedom just to rock up do we go to the game do we not go to the game and I think this has just come as a big shock I don't I, you know I think we um never saw this coming it's clearly had a massive impact and everybody's got a story to tell I mean it's unbelievable the amount of um stuff that's impacted on businesses people's personal lives but uh, I remember doing a, a piece on Sky Sports I think it was uh, around about the 13th of March and the Premier League had just said, look, we're going to close down, I think, for three weeks. Um, I think Arteta had tested positive at Arsenal and it was like, this is just a short term blip. And I think truly everybody believed that we'd be sort of back not to normal by April. And it's hard to believe that we're now in November and we still got the same struggles. Um, and I do worry. I do worry for a lot of football clubs and, and rugby clubs. Rugby is very much in, in my heart. Um, but um, I'd like to think that there is a sense of optimism that, you know, through the turn of the year, we can get back to normal. And I think what I would say is for what we take for granted, I'm not so sure we will do going forward. I think that experience of going to a live game and please God, you know, we'll all be at Headingley this time next year and we can get to Ellen Road. I think we'll appreciate it perhaps a lot more than what we have done in the past. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, through when we turn the year, I think obviously this next month is clearly critical for us, but um, it's not going to last forever. And I think the sooner we can get back into stadiums and enjoy that atmosphere. And it's not just watching a game. It's sat with your mates. It's sat with the great sort of characters who one's whinging at the referee all day long. One has a go at the player. It's the lady that you know, gives the mint humbugs out on match day. That is the experience that is so invaluable to our lives. Um, and I just hope for everybody's, you know, for all of our lives and, and in particular sport and in particular for Yorkshire, we can get back to some normality in 2021. Jerry? Hi, yeah, good morning to everybody. 
Jerry Sutcliffe, former Minister for Sports. I'm currently the chairman of the National Horse Racing College in Doncaster. And obviously the horse racing industry has been hit by the pandemic. We're currently um, performing behind closed doors. But the pandemic has had an impact on suppliers, um, communities. Uh, my other chief consideration is young people and children, the opportunity for them to continue to play sport. So whilst I agree with what the government have done in terms of the lockdown now over the next month, we need to be consistent and dedicated to make sure there are pathways through for youngsters, particularly playing sports at all levels uh, after you know we get over this next month. So I'm optimistic about the future, but I do hope that there is some consistency in what the government are doing. You know, we've moved from, you know, you can't play golf or you can't play tennis. I don't see why you can't do that, but that's in the outdoors. So I think there's got to be some consistency around the rules. And, and lastly to you, Mark. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Arthur. I'm Chief Executive of Yorkshire Cricket. Um, when the pandemic first hit us, uh, our players were in India on pre-season tour. They'd been there two, a total of two days. So the first uh, objective was to get them home safely uh, to their family. Obviously, we'd never experienced anything like this, so we had nothing to, uh, uh, to benchmark uh, any decision against, but we felt it was right and proper to, to bring them home. And then we were quite quick to adopt the uh, government's furlough scheme. Uh, uh, in total, I suppose we've lost about 25% of income. So the priority was to keep cash in the business. And by adopting that uh, furlough scheme, uh, support from the England and Wales Cricket Board uh, to the tune of uh, half a million of pounds. Uh, all counties got a grant uh, in, in that respect. Um, continued support from our sponsors. Uh, they, the majority kept their money uh, in our business to support us. Um, and the Yorkshire members, we, we said halfway through the season that we would, uh, if people wanted their money back, then uh, we, we would um, issue them with, uh, with a credit. Uh, but if they could give us a, a donation, then that would be fantastic. We had an unbelievable response um, going against the grain of Yorkshire folk being tight. 85% um, of our members donated their membership fee. Now, if I compare this to Nottinghamshire at 70%, Warwickshire at 60%, uh, you can see how, how important cricket is uh, to the people of Yorkshire. And we also embarked on a, you know, a cost-cutting exercise. Uh, we had to re-evaluate every aspect of the business. But you know, whilst we're a major worldwide brand name, we are actually a very small business. Um, and from my days of being chief exec at, at Nottingham Forest, where I worked uh, for um, somebody from the, the, the world of private equity, uh, we, we've kept, we keep things very, very tight uh, at Yorkshire. We don't have an abundance of staff. Uh, we, I think we have about 49 staff. Lancashire have over 300 staff. So um, we kept things really tight. And I'm pleased to say that we've come out, it, out of it quite well. Uh, we've plugged that, uh, that gap, uh, that uh, loss of income. Um, we got cricket going, all, although it was uh, behind closed doors. Um, I, I, personally su supported the ECB, but felt that the government uh, were unrealistic. We had an 18 and a half thousand seater stadium and uh, for championship cricket, you'd normally only get 2000 people. Well, I think even somebody like me can uh, help towards socially uh, um, distancing people uh, with that capacity. But it did give us a streaming opportunity. We were able to uh, stream uh, all our matches home and away um, and therefore, and give a link to uh, our supporters wherever they were in the world. Uh, and I think that has given us a new opportunity going forward. Uh, and we will work with a number of partners in order to um, improve that, that, that uh, facility in the future. And, and moving to the future, I'm incredibly optimistic. Uh, we lost uh, practically all of our, our season, no fans, no supporters in any shape or form. But I think next year, once the vaccine is, is widely available um, and uh, hopefully we will get uh, cricket going again in April, I think there's going to be a surge of interest for all events, for all sports. People will want to get out of their, 
their homes, they will want to interact with uh, their fellow human beings and they will want to make up for lost time. So 2021, whilst there's great uncertainty, uh, I'm hugely optimistic about the surge of interest that there will be for sports and events. Um, that, that was a nice, nice positive note to bring that, that bit to, to an end. But you, I'm going to pick up a point that both that, that you made in there, which was about the fact that the challenge of not being able to deliver what you would normally for members and for fans made you look at different ways of doing that. How, well, I'm a, I assume, and please tell me if I'm wrong, that all of you will have, have looked at that and looked at ways you can adapt how you deliver for those partners, for those sponsors, for, for the members, you know. How, how much opportunity do you see from those going forward? Because obviously, yes, hopefully we all, we all want fans to return to stadiums, but if this becomes a new revenue stream as well, can that help bolster the, the difficulties that, are, that, are, that could be faced longer term? I can see Dr. Ingrid nodding, so I'll throw it to her. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think um, developing sort of the, the direct to consumer pathways in relation to sort of that connectivity um, does give an element of autonomy and perhaps empowerment to those um, clubs, uh, franchises, etc., to give um, a little bit more back in terms of getting uh, revenue streams back up and running. It probably, on the other hand, might impact upon the um, demand, if you like, of terrestrial TV sell, uh, setups, etc. But it does mean that there's an opportunity to explore how you can do that D to C um, sort of uh, connectivity within sort of the clubs to ensure that you do have uh, opportunity to maximise income generation um, that is directly benefit to that um, club in particular. So there's definitely leverage going forward in terms of how you can maximise um, opportunities around sort of the digitalisation of uh, fan engagement, if you like. The, we you, you talk about we talk about you know watching it on telly and you know that being the only way we can enjoy football and cricket and and rugby at the moment. But as, as you said, the, there is a, there's a there's an emotional disconnect from that. Um, do you see a way that that you can try and bring those fans together in, in some sort of meaningful way digitally as well, or is that already happening with with digital media and social media and things like that? It's happening, Ben, in the terms of the West Ham game the other week, you know, the, the game was shown in a cinema with 500 people there, but yet people couldn't go into the stadium. And that's why I'm saying there needs to be some consistency around the rules. Mark talks about the 18,000 capacity in the cricket ground, but only 2,000 people turning up. So I think once the government have got the virus under control, when we get back to allowing fans into stadia, I think things can happen. In racing, race meetings have taken place. I'm a resource owner we've been allowed to go and watch the horses run, which is that connection you know, with the sports. And so I think that um, whilst you look at the income streams, I think sports have come together because they've had to in terms of looking at what their opportunities are, and that's a good thing. But I do think that the government have got a role to play in terms of how you get fans back in, because it goes back to what Victor was saying, that there's an emotional connect. You know, we, we want to go see our teams, we want to go and, and feel the sports, you know, and that's very important. I think that the other the other part of this economic part is the way that sport fits into the wider Yorkshire economy. So I know I was quite happy to being able to write about Leeds United being promoted. Well, what feels like way back when now, even though it wasn't wasn't that long ago. But because of the economic bump that everyone talked about having a Premier League club club brings to to a city to a to a region, obviously part of that is always from the fans. Um, so we've talked, you know, there's a lot of talk at the minute with lockdown too about the hospitality industry how how closely aligned are those two sectors and i guess probably that might be one you're looking at john with putting on a, a big global tournament how do you work with with that uncertainty yeah I, I, I mean it's challenging but we we have a plan and we're just going to have a, agility uh, to be able to react to the environment um I, I think back to richard's point um at the start let, let, let's let's understand why we go to watch live sports <coughs> We go with our friends and families to create memories. It's a social experience. Our, our strap line is the power of together. And that's what we want to do is we want to bring people together. We can stage a brilliant digital broadcast event. Every minute of every one of our games is live on the BBC. But none of that 
really works unless we actually bring people together. So we, we've just got to uh, understand the health environment. Um, we've got to cr obviously create a safe environment and we've got to build consumer confidence. But one of the really interesting aspects at the moment, Ben, is, is we, we are now um, halfway through our ballot. So we've opened up for tickets and we have massively exceeded our expectations on ticket sales so far. And I think that just goes to show the desire for people to have something to look forward to in 12 months time that brings people back together. And Mark, Mark's point, um, the, the, the appetite, I think, will be stronger than ever before. That, 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 that's, a, that's a fantastic way to look at it. I guess the other, then looking at the other sort of challenges, Victor, you know, you've been responsible for bringing some fantastic players to Leeds. How has COVID impacted those sorts of conversations and how you go about recruiting future talent? It's true that it was difficult. It was a difficult summer in terms of the market that all the uncertainty, all the people say, no, all the people won't sell players or won't have it coming, but not all the people think about that because if you sell a player, you need to buy. And then it's a lot of uncertainty. And it was a really strange market that, and even for the players, no, that all the first contact asks you, what is the situation of the COVID in, in England? No, when you are going to, to pick a player from, from abroad, no, and and was a, a difficult situation that obviously we try short with creativity because we have the resource limited, like a new promoted team, no. But all the people talk about the same <coughs> about feelings, no. I, I need to be really proud to have a sponsor really loyalty to the club, really really lo loyalty, even the fans, no. Behind me, I have a crowdy that was friends of Madrid made for me, and. We are the team that I bro broke the records about the crowd in the stadium without public, no? And at the end, we are talking about the same. It's engagement, no? The people can sit in front of TV, but we need to be completely honest. Even in front of TV, it's not the same watch a game alone that watch a game with a friend or your family or even a rival that you can kid in and, and enjoy about about the, the football, no? Or about the cricket, rugby and horses. That was my discovery in England that before I never realized the passion of horse racing and I arrived to England and now I love, I absolutely love uh, like this, this emotion, no? But we need to have the responsibility that because looks a bit pessimist, be optimistic because we are a really part of the society in terms of that. I think, and um, Mr. Kramer said, that one of the reasons that the people start the things is going to be normal is when back the sports. Mm -hmm. I remember during the lockdown, uh, people making run of uh, balls, uh, making hair, uh, making a lot of kiddings because the people start to feel a normal situation with back the sports. And we have the responsibility to be op optimistic. Another person I wrote that told give value to the small things is really important. And really important when you feel fan of a club in all our clubs now, and you back and back to the normality, think that, wow, this is now a privilege. And I need to be honest, I spend money in the rugby, I spend money and taking a share of the, in cricket, go to the horse, make a bet. All this continue feeding the sport because it's not with a big shock like we have with the COVID. Wow, was in risk. And like Mr. Kramer said, I still really, really worry about another clubs in Championship League One or League Two that oof, can be really struggling. And we, we need to be really solidarity from the Premier League now because it's really not only talk about the top five, it's not talk about all the sports. Even the Sunday League, even the Sunday League, like it's a part important of the people going to play with his friends after the game, take a beer, socialize. I remember my times in, in the Sunday league with my friends and still I have 20 friends going with me we, because we, we was part in a team in a Sunday league, no? And, and these kind of things or links and connections that you have playing sports, it is really difficult to match in another sociability, no? I won't recommend it, a book that was a, a, um, wrote before of the pandemic. His name is Antifragile. It's really incredible. It's a book that try to talk like how we can have things that gain from the disorder. It's a philosophical perspective really good because all the people talk 
in the bad moment, you need to be resilient. That was a concept that I used in the past. But the resilience past the bad moments without move. And this is not completely good. It's good, but it's not completely good. The idea of this uh, writer, Nassim Taleb, is past the bad moments improving, past the bad moments modeling, past the bad moments learning things. And it's one thing that we need to, to make, perhaps sustainability about economical situations, give the real value to the funds, because we always give, but was like a, always the same quote. Now we really know what important is the funds. <laughs> now we really know it, the weight in the numbers. It, and it, then it, for it, me, this is a really good important point that understanding these bad moments, how can change in, in a, the things to try improve. It's interesting you say that. So someone's someone's uh, put a comment in saying that you know fans are the lifeblood of live sport, and actually you know what they've asked what the panel thinks you know what you've just said. How we change that that landscape of sometimes fans have perhaps felt maybe disenfranchised or, or disillusioned by their clubs for for whatever reason. How how do clubs go about now creating that solidarity and and, and moving forward and and tournaments I guess as well. Um, you know, does anyone want to a lot of examples. Aberdeen make a nice thing. Aberdeen in Scotland make a nice thing. It's a lot of examples. There are a lot of fans saving clubs in this moment, eh? and it's really, really nice to her. Yeah, I just I think what um, may happen here is, is you know I think when we do get back to normal, we get the fans back, and it won't be a you know turn the tap on and hundred percent can come back. It will clearly be a, on, a, on a phased basis. But where perhaps um, that relationship between the clubs or the governing bodies and the fans or whatever it is, I, I, th I think it will change. Uh, I think there's probably a realisation both sides of the coin that um, the fans really are very much the lifeblood. And we always sort of say that, you know, the fans pay the wages and all that. But I think it's more than that. I think they add greatly to the experience, even with the club. And it's interesting that Victor was saying the he's missing on the club's missing the emotion of the fans being there. And uh, it's almost inevitable that I think there will be a reevaluation of that. Um, so again, um, we mustn't necessarily forget the pain of what we've gone through over the last nine months. Uh, and I, I can see uh, a lot more of a bond between the fans and, and the clubs. Um, but also I, I think certainly from a, a Leeds perspective and Yorkshire perspective, what we've missed out on this year um, very much and even the last few months is the real impact of Leeds United being in the Premier League. Uh, and uh, I think we're all very confident, Victor, that um, next year we will definitely be in the Premier League. Uh, and I think when we get back to normal, the, the atmosphere in the city and Yorkshire uh, because we've just got, you're going to get fans coming in, even if they don't go to the game. Victor will know this. Fans come to Leeds for the experience in Yorkshire. And they might go to a horse racing meeting. They might go to a cricket match. They might have an experience going to a rugby league match or going to Headingley. And I think this is so vital for Leeds and Yorkshire that we've got great cricket, rugby league, football. Uh, and it feels a bit at the moment, there's a big hole uh, in the city we're missing something but when we get back to normal I think Leeds will be absolutely buzzing and West Yorkshire and parts of Yorkshire where you know there's great things to do you know and um, I think what we'll find is is uh, there'll be almost this pent-up feeling that you know almost like we've been in prison for a year and we've been liberated and we're going to enjoy ourselves so again I, you know, I, I have a great sense of optimism that what we've taken for granted on both sides will will have a very positive impact going forward. And that moment when you can hug your sort of next door neighbour, uh, when you sat next to him, you know, you'll feel the emotion even more. But I'll, I'll hand over to Ingrid. <laughs> okay. I think I just want to really put in here at this point is that there are the sort of 
Richard touched upon some very interesting points there, um, along with what Victor has also alluded to in terms of that um, sort of uh, a sense of solidarity within sport and sort of from the top flight down to grassroots. But I also think this shines a light on those sports that are have always been struggling for participation or for spectatorship and those sponsorship deals. So women's sport, disability sport, sort of those emerging sports will, cer will certainly have um, been dealt an another devastating blow in in terms of what COVID has done. So I think there's an opportunity to re-shine a light on those sports that are emerging, um, an opportunity sort of that we're all in this together. It's all affected us at somehow. Um, but I think not to forget those sort of, I'm not going to say silent sports, but certainly those sports that are sort of there in the background and incredibly important to the mainstream sports also. I think that's important, Ingrid, because of the health and well-being the sport brings to people right across the range, you know, whether it's disability sport or elite sport. Mm -hmm. It, it makes people feel better. And Richard, you're right to make the point about Leeds United, but think about Harrogate as well. Harrogate, uh, you know, time going into the Football League, Harrogate is, is buzzing because of, of that, you know. So sport has that opportunity to, you know, lead to make people feel better. But the horse racing industry is £300 million pounds to the Yorkshire economy but with the nine race courses that we've got in Yorkshire. But it's not just the race courses, it's the supply chain to that. So. In, when we do start to go back, we have to look at the impact that sport has on the suppliers and the jobs that sport creates across the county. It's interesting you say that because I was going to bring that on to, you know, obviously we've touched about the impact it's had at, at top tier sport and in recruiting top tier sport, but grassroots sports plays a, a crucial part in both developing talent, but also, as we've said, in, in people's mental and social well-being. You know, how do elite clubs and elite organizations fit in with supporting that you know what is going on and that that solidarity approach i guess you know mark typically you know cricketers work their way up to to, to yorkshire do you see it there could be an issue because of the fact there's been no grassroots sport for a period in terms of recruit future talent you know future yorkshire players you know, I'm not so worried about the talent coming through uh, to uh, professional Yorkshire cricket. I think you know, we have uh, 900 uh, uh, boys in, in the pathway scheme at the moment and you know, they will always be there. I'm, I'm more concerned about the recreational uh, cricketer, uh, <laughs> the person that um, you know, plays cricket from time to time or, 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 or once a week. And um, the overheads uh, of, of running a local cricket club uh, are proportionately very high. And if they rely on um, some minor sponsorship, as, as you know, Leeds United would see it, or, or Yorkshire Cricket, or, or the rugby would see minor sponsorship, you know, the thousand pounds here, the ten thousand pounds there, very important to grassroots um, sport. Um, and I have a, a slight concern that that uh, that will disappear. Having said that, this year we found in a number of cricket clubs. Um, more people uh, coming back to the game of cricket, especially youngsters that maybe have played at school or uh, had gone off to university. And, and they, during the summer, they were bored and they wanted something to do. So they went along with their mates. And, and in our case, they were playing, playing cricket. I, I think there will be, we've seen the, the Im huge impact with cycling uh, uh, th this year. How many more people have, have gone out and and started cycling and golf courses have been very, very busy uh, as well. Um, so I, I think it's some of the traditional sports that lower down uh, are going to have to um, uh, look for support from the national governing bodies. And, and certainly in cricket, we're, we're right in the, the middle of a, um, uh, a fantastic TV deal, a five year deal that the ECB uh, um, uh, made uh, with Sky and the BBC. And, a lot of money uh, has been set aside for the development of, of uh, grassroots uh, cricket uh, inclusion uh, and, the, and in particular uh, the development of girls and women's cricket which is a big uh, boom area uh, for us and we're seeing rapid growth in, in, in that area. You, you touched on something there that obviously sponsorship is so important. Have, have we seen any change in what sponsors are perhaps, perhaps looking for um, in terms of you know, as a result of not being able to attend games, you know, sponsors would normally get tickets or, or, or whatnot. But has that changed perhaps what they're looking for? I guess, John, the Rugby World Cup will be doing a lot of deals in that sense at the minute. 
Yeah, I, I, I think one of the themes uh, of the whole morning is um, to recognise that the world was changing before the pandemic. So the commercial landscape dramatically, how we consume digital and broadcast um, and consumer behaviour and what the pandemic has done will accelerate some of that change. So inevitably, um, commercial, are people looking for a traditional um, gold package deal to buy some rights and have some tickets and have some uh, LED advertising? Not really. P people are looking for a narrative. And, and a lot of that, I think, plays into some of the questions that people are, are asking. So if I would describe ourselves, we are a tournament with a purpose. We stand for three things. Inclusivity, the men's, women's and wheelchair tournaments being staged together on the same platform. Social impact, doing um, positive work in local communities with an enormous focus on mental health. I think mental health and, and well-being is something that the sport of rugby league is taking seriously. I think everyone um, will take seriously because of the challenges and adversity people are facing. Uh, and also a commitment to shining a spotlight on the north of England. And, and I think that plays all the way through to grassroots, um, the legacy that we will leave behind and using this opportunity that major events have to actually make a difference beyond um, what happens um, when the trophies are lifted and the fireworks go off. So the landscape was changing, the pandemic will accelerate it, but I think we should look with hope, optimism and positivity to the future that actually some of these things will make us um, better. We, we've had it. We've had a question that sort of ties ties into what you said there from from Naomi, who, who mentioned that. How do you all rate the importance of uh, and look at building inclusion for marginalised communities during COVID and moving forward between clubs and tournaments and uh, and those communities? Does anyone want to anyone want to go first? Well, I, I see it vitally important. You know, I, I, as a former sports minister, inclusion and participation is to the benefit of the nation because people. A fitter and healthier, and does, you know it doesn't cost the NHS lots of money, but you you want people to be fitter and healthier, and sport can do that. Elite sport acts as the the headline, if you like, in terms of giving that uh, impetus for people to get out into sport. But there's got to be a look downwards uh, in the pyramids to make sure that uh, the grassroots are supported. And clearly, with the pandemic, lots of smaller clubs, junior clubs, and things like that are not being supported. And our government and Sport England and others are doing their best. But we've got to try and help, you know, those clubs survive through this pandemic. Which brings us nice on to, I guess, that, you know, what sort of support would you like to see, whether it's from government or from, you know, sporting bodies to, to keep, you know, to keep things going? And, uh, you know, as, as we go through another period of uncertainty with, with a lockdown 2.0 um, coming into effect as of midnight to last night. Yeah, this morning. Well, I, I'll, I'll go first on that. I, I'd like the government to properly understand sport because I don't think it does. Um, and that might sound a, a little bit controversial, but I think uh, you know it's been a, a one size fits all. Um, there's been conversations about the, the big divide between the North and the South and somebody, you know, I, I come from the South and only living in the North, do you understand that that, that is a reality? But I would like um, uh, going forward, uh, the, the, the government to understand that actually sport has a, a real job to do in society uh, and that sport does bring people together from all different diverse um, uh, areas of our life um, and it should it should trust sport a little bit more to deal with some of the social issues that this uh, this country faces uh, and I, I just I just think you know it, with the recent lockdown um, I, I, you know, Robbie Savage did an absolutely outstanding podcast uh, yesterday questioning some of the decisions in a very rational way over you know, why school children, for example, uh, are mixing together in the classroom, but they can't play uh, football together outside in the open air. You know, some of the decisions that the government have been making have been illogical, and, and I would like to see uh, some proper dialogue uh, going on when we get out of this pandemic about how sport can, can play a major part in, uh, in, in inclusion within our society. It, it, that's an interesting point because COVID has changed the way perhaps we perceive sport, not just from being fans, but you know, there was, there was that perception at the start of, of lockdown when uh, Matt Hancock made some very harsh comments about Premier League football players. Um, to then, we, we, we're sitting at a time where Marcus Rashford has been doing great things off the pitch as well as on it, which as a Liverpool fan causes me a few few issues. So if you could stop doing the stuff on the pitch, that would be a, be a great benefit to me. Um, 
But how much do you think that th things are changing where sports people are starting to perhaps take on a different role of being a mentor or a, a positive influencer rather than just being someone that, you know, we all aspire to play like or play with on a pitch on a, on a Saturday or Sunday? I mean, I just, I mean, obviously Victor will know much more than I do, but um, I just thought, you know, a couple of things with Leeds United, um, they were like one of the first teams, Victor, to say, fine, we'll take pay cuts. The first and was, also, yeah, when the government was, stopped the, the, the free school meals, I think, again, the Leeds United boys immediately put their hands up and said, you know, we'll try and help. So, you know, that's very encouraging. And clearly that shows a, a great spirit there at Leeds for almost those players to say we want to take the lead. But you might explain the philosophy, Victor, behind that. No, for us, the philosophy was clear. We considered the club a part of the family. And when we have the meeting with the players, we know that if we cannot take this decision for the club cash flow perspective of the club, it's a lot of people going to redundant. And in this moment, okay, remember the situation. We have a good difference for promoted, but it's football. Remember that we lose the first game against Cardiff. All can be happened. Happened the, the season before, but the, my players, I feel really proud. The staff, Marcelo Bielsa and all his staff. I feel really proud because they immediately understand the situation and they accept the deferral for save the positions and the and the roles and the works of all the people in Leeds United and was an example that I feel can be only really proud because they understand that they are obviously the most important part of the club, but it's a lot of people around working in in security, in in ticketing, that the, in hospitality that now obviously are in, in, in far log, but they are feeling that they can support the club in this perspective. And to be honest, I, I feel really proud about that. At the end, in my opinion, the football and the sports professional we can watch in other countries and continents are proving that with security that we are discussing, Mark said, Gary said, with security, we can go against the pandemic. We can obviously in a moment short and in the NBA proof, uh, by example, finish the season, the Champions League finish the season. For me, it's a very big good example about the top flight trying because we discuss a lot. And now this month, we need to battle the pandemic at home, like is the decision of the government. But in a moment, we need to battle the pandemic outside the home with security, with ideas, because obviously the mental health, the economy needs to survive. And for me, the professional sport give a really good image eh? in a lot of examples eh? about that. And with security, with really good protocols, really well done, any positive immediately self-isolate, controlling the entourage. And for me, this situation need to continue because in a moment again, we need to battle the pandemic outside with ideas, with security, with health, but for keep this business life that is a lot of important for a lot of people. Mark, a question for you from, from Leo. How, how is the pandemic influencing strategic planning and, and management of, of the organization? So, you know, whether it's creating financial reserves or, or looking at you know, changing business models. Um, it's made us uh, reevaluate everything that uh, that we're doing. Not only what we've done in the past, but um, how we how we get through next year, where there is uh, uncertainty. As I said earlier, I do believe that the fans will will, will flood back uh, to major sporting uh, events. Um, uh, but uh, I do have a, a concern about the ability of some businesses to support um, their local. Um, or regional clubs, whether, they, whether they're amateur or, or professional, um, at the same level as they, they did do, say, in our case in, in 2019 when we had the, the Ashes. I think, you know, as businesses reevaluate where they are, um, there is a chance that uh, they will be far more selective over where they're spending their. Um, their, their marketing and, and entertainment budgets. And I think that's a, a concern. 
the other area that we need to, to look at is that, you know, from our point of view, and Ellen Road have a fantastic uh, function facility, that Zoom and, and um, uh, Microsoft Teams has now introduced a new way of meeting people. Um, and if, if a company was to have, say, six uh, external meetings a year, they may now do four by Zoom and, and two on a face-to-face -face basis. So I do think the conference and event uh, business is something that we need to, uh, to look at and, and uh, make sure that our offering is up to date. Um, so I, I do think there are some, um, some interesting conversations to be had in, in the next year and probably by 22, 23, uh, then there will be a leveling out process and there will be a change. You know, uh, er everybody's methods of operation will inevitably change. Um, um, one of the opportunities is obviously further embracing the digital age. So I've got, we're coming to the end of the session. So I've got two final questions. One very quick one um, is going straight to John, which is you mentioned obviously putting on the World Cup uh, in, in such uncertain times. How much in the way of contingency uh, are you having to build into it around fixtures, for example? Um, yeah, it's a significant uh, different scenarios um, that we'll all revisit um, in the new year. We've got 61 games across 21 venues, so we've got to be uh, very nimble. I was just totting up before, we've got actually 27 of our 61 games in uh, in Yorkshire uh, to look forward to. So lo lots of scenario playing, but for now, hope, faith, optimism, and lots of positivity. Right, so as a quick closing question, I think, two things one obviously let's hope that things can come back to normal over the next 12 months and obviously we can all accept that yorkshire's got fantastic sporting pedigree what are you all looking forward to over this period and then the other one would be i can't talk about the future without mentioning the b word how much of an impact do you think Bre brexit could have on the future of sport let's keep that one short because covid can be depressing and hard enough as it is before we get on to brexit so again, we'll start as we did with start with Victor with what he's looking forward to over the next 12 months. Okay, the first and like all the people say, for me can be a really big disappointment if we relegate it and the people cannot watch any game in Premier League. It's, I think I cannot cope this. So I am not going, I am going to the Ida River and fall up. <laughs> After 16 years, we are relegated and the people can watch the game. I am, I can not my reaction. I think perhaps I go to the river direct. So <laughs> this is my reaction. And hope so this is not happening, obviously. And I am going to work hard and all the people is working hard for this thing. It's, it's not happening. And about the B war, today is a deficit day in, in football with a meeting. And I prefer keep my opinion with myself. Yeah. The Premier League give a good line to the FAI because for me, unlike a Spaniard and the talent can grow in another, in around the world. And obviously we are the responsibility to improve the talent in England, like football. But if you analyze the best result of the English national team was with the high standards level in the English football. And when the people say about the chances, about the young players in England, a lot of young players play in England, Alexander Arnold, to mention Marcus Ramsford, Calvin Phillips, Greenwood. We have a uh, Jack Grealish. We have a lot of names that top quality. What is better? The quantity of the quality. Because when the high level of the league gives quality, a lot of English players develop, even now develop abroad, like Jadon Sancho, that help win Spain when we won the World Cup. What is one of the reasons that Spain won the World Cup? Because a lot of young talent develop abroad and improve his level. And what's the real reason? Because in the 80s, Spain have a really good team to win in the World Cup 86, really good team. Uh, what happened why now in a period we have really good results in the national team? For be open and develop the talent. And what's of the reason? Another countries like Russia, that I work there and I can talk about that, reduce the number of the uh, war permit. What's happened with the national team like that? Because they bet for the quantity. It needs better bet for the quality. And for me, we have the responsibility that clubs improve the talent of our English players. 
and Leeds United make put the the Leeds United Academy in category one, we with Andrea Radicani increase the investment of the academy in the facilities in a lot of things. But we need to be really clever in not take the majoric decisions that can be worse for the future. And this is really important to understand, in my opinion. And I have more opinions that I prefer don't share no. because I think I can have and get a lot of troubles. Yeah. No, well, we don't want you to but, get into any but trouble. No, no, I only want to say one thing. One, Dan Ashworth, Brighton director of football, that was director of the FA, that you can read about his opinions about that, is really clear. It's an English person talking about that, no Mia, Barber, Spaniard back in from the Mediterranean to talk about that. Uh, Michael Edward from Liverpool have the same opinion. I feel really, really calm because I feel that we are aligned. And for me, this is really important because when I was child and I started to watch the Premier League, it was amazing that the amazing player that play, but when I arrived, I remember Gianfranco Sola and all the talent arrived, the product grow like be the first in the world by difference. The Spanish league now, it's for me second position, but with a really big gap, really big gap. Why? For a lot of things. And now that the things are making really well in this situation, please don't use a political situation for saying that this improve going to be worse, in my opinion. Perfect. John, we'll go to you. Same, same two questions. What are you looking forward to over the next 12 months? Clearly delivering the business okay. ever a uh, rugby league world cup, spending lots of time um, in Yorkshire. Um, the question about Brexit, I, I think it will have some challenges, but insignificant compared to dealing with the pandemic. Dr. Ingrid. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm looking forward to this, uh, seeing the bounce back ability of sport that, you know, absolute um, does recover. And I think how and the shape um, and the, the sort of with the reinvigor of what um, sport is all about. So I'm looking forward in terms of how it's re-energized, particularly from spectators. Um, and absolutely agree with John that um, some of the issues around Brexit will probably pale into significance and can certainly be dealt with or certainly um, because we're used to dealing with issues that probably have far longer and reaching sort of issues for sport in, imminently. So I think Brexit is one of those, I think we'll address that as and when it comes to it rather than panic about it now. Richard? Um, I just probably the emotion. Um, I think back to one of the last live games I went to was uh, Rob Borrow's testimonial match in January. And I have to tell you that I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. Grown men just crying, watching that. And that's just raw, natural emotion. That is not artificial. But to go back into a stadium and participate and enjoy it, and just maybe we've taken for granted, as I said, but just looking forward to maybe just that feeling, that natural feeling of how wonderful live sport is and being with your friends and enjoying the whole experience, which we've forgotten, unfortunately, a little bit. Jerry? Yes, yeah, supporting what Richard said, bringing people together, allowing sport to inspire people as it's always done. I always remember London 2012, what that meant to the country, how it inspired a generation. So looking forward to that happening again. And on Brexit, as a politician, we haven't got long enough. <laughs> and Mark, lastly to you. So I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, members and supporters coming back to, to our ground uh, to be able to interact with them. Uh, they have a, a massive impact on our players, players playing uh, any sport uh, within um, uh, a, a stadium without uh, spectators. It, it's just a, uh, a weird uh, uh, type of experience. And I think in football, we've seen this year that uh, the, the home spectators can have an impact uh, on, their, uh, on their home team. Um, more so than I think we probably uh, realised before this uh, this pandemic. I'm also looking forward to uh, India's first uh, test match visit to Emerald Headingley, the first one for 19 years. Um, and, uh, I, I, and with regard to the, the, the Brexit uh, word, I'm not sure that that's going to impact us on in, in any shape or form, except you know, some of the people that uh, we, we obviously partner. 
you know, we, we, we work with Australia, we work with South Africa, we work with India, we work with Pakistan, West Indies and, and Sri Lanka. So um, not too many uh, European countries uh, uh, involved there. <laughs> So that, 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 that's a good way to end. And firstly, thank you all for taking the time for this conversation. Thank you for everyone for watching at home. I hope you found it interesting. It's been insightful for me. I think the one thing we can all take away is the fact that we all want to feel that emotion of sport back together and joining and having fun together. There will be a write-up of this event and a video available on thebusinessdesk.com. So yes, thank you again for joining us and thank you to all my panellists and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.